So, I am told we are back on line. So, what I am going to do is I want all of you to look up your exercise sheets. Come to page 19, we have on that page the beginning of the exercise list for cycles. We have from C A 1 to C A 33 and I will just browse through and tell you what is involved in each exercise. C A 1 is about the Carnot cycle and its analysis. We have to determine the work ratio, work done per cycle and even the mean effective pressure. You will realize that the volumetric compression ratio is 20 and the pressure at the inlet that is the lowest pressure is 1 bar. Since the volume reduces by a factor of 20, the temperature rises by a factor of 3 at the point where you have the highest temperature and the lowest volume the pressure will be 20 into 3 that is 60 times very high. So, the pressure ratio for the cycle will be from 1 bar to 60 bar. So, ratio of 60 even then you will find the mean effective pressure is pretty low although the highest pressure is as high as 60 bar. Then C A 2 is the same thing to be done for the Stirling and the Ericsson cycle to see in what way they differ from the Carnot cycle. Well, 3 and 4 are uh, standard stuff variation of Carnot efficiency and analysis of some um, queer cycles. 5 is characteristic of a typical Brayton cycle. C A 6 is uh, reversed Carnot. So, this is a Carnot refrigerator cycle. Then C A 7 is a joule cycle. Eight and nine are auto cycle. Ten are eleven are diesel cycle and up to here I do not think I have any additional idea or additional uh, term involved. But 12 is a dual cycle that means a mixture of the Carnot character uh, sorry the auto characteristic and the diesel characteristic explain it to them on the PV diagram that part of the uh, combustion is at constant volume or is modelled at constant volume first part and the second part is modelled as at constant pressure and 12 and 13 are on diesel cycle uh, dual cycle. Again I will you will notice that 14 is on auto cycle and petrol engine. Uh, 15 is again on diesel engines, slightly more involved problem. Now we come to modifications. Now I always find it an excellent idea to introduce modifications using exercises, so that the effect is immediately seen. 
for example, 16 is Brayton, the reheat modification is introduced here. Now, 17 is a gas turbine plant that means essentially Brayton cycle and the modifications introduced in this and compared with each other are reheat, intercooling, regeneration, and all together. And 18 is similar to 17, but now component efficiencies are involved. that is in the analysis, now we will have to include eta turbine and eta compressor. These isentropic efficiencies are already introduced during the open system analysis. So, this is the application of that. And 19 is a what I called clipped Brayton cycle where the purpose is not to produce power for output, but have a turbine sized exactly to provide the power for the compressor. So, the turbine exhaust will be at a pressure higher than the ambient and the high pressure air at the exit of the turbine is expanded through a nozzle and the nozzle exit velocity provides an appropriate amount of thrust. So, use the conservation of momentum equation across the jet engine to get the static thrust. This is one problem in the thermodynamics where conservation of momentum will have to be used. Now, 20 is Rankine cycle and I think it uses only saturated steam. Now, saturated steam cycles for fossil fuel based power plants are rather rare these days, but when it comes to nuclear power plants or solar thermal power plants, they are not very uncommon. In fact, for nuclear power plants, saturated steam cycles are the default cycles used. 21 is the same type of Rankine cycle, but with superheated steam. Twenty two is based on a Rankine cycle using ammonia. properties of ammonia are uh, given. So, and I think these are sufficient. Twenty three is also standard ranking with some component efficiency, eta turbine is given. 24 is Rankine with reheat. So, you can combine uh, compare the characteristic with uh, that of a cycle without a reheat. 
the intermediate pressure is given as 8 bar. Explain reheat here, here explain intercooling and explain regeneration in breaking cycle at the appropriate place and explain reheat in the Rankine cycle here. Then when you come to 25, you will have uh, Rankine with a single stage of regeneration. What you call regenerative feed heating. We are doing a course on thermodynamics, so we do not have to worry about different types of reheaters and various combinations or trains of reheating. For that we go to the steam turbine course, which is usually an elective. So, just a case with uh, one mixer type of reheater is good enough. Now, 26 is uh, well the word nuclear is immaterial here. You can say it is a steam plant in which dry saturated steam is supplied to the turbine. Now, the disadvantage of the dry saturated steam supplied to the turbine is that as the steam expands to the turbine, the dryness fraction becomes lower and lower, which is not good for the life of the turbine. The turbine blades will get eroded off in no time. So, what is done is uh, as it expands at various intermediate stages, it is taken out of the turbine, put through a separator. The separator will separate it into dry saturated steam and uh, saturated liquid. The dry saturated steam is then sent to the uh, further turbine, the next pressure turbine intermediate pressure or low pressure, whereas the liquid is throttled to the condenser pressure and discharged into the condenser. So, this is uh, saturated steam Rankine cycle, but with uh, separators between turbines. If you sketch the T S diagram, it will look like this. We have saturated steam. Let us say just one separation stage in between. I think in the uh, exercise there are three stages of separation, one at 20 bar, one at 5 bar and one at 1 bar. So, let us say this is the condenser pressure this is the boiler pressure, this is the boiler exit state. If I were to expand it completely, I would end up with very wet steam at the condenser pressure. So, what is done is I will show you just one stage. You expand it in between when you say you have reached a tolerable limit and then that, that intermediate pressure put it through a separator. If you want to know what a separator is, we have already done an exercise come to open systems on page 18, exercise OS 24 contains both a separator and a mixer. Okay, so, apply first law to the separator, we have all the three states known. So, the two mass flow rates can be determined, the amount of steam flowing out and amount of liquid flowing out. Let us say this is state 1, first turbine expands it to a state 2. Then the separator splits it into two part, a state 3 which is dry saturated steam at that intermediate pressure. Let us say P s is the intermediate pressure and another stream at 4 which is saturated liquid at that pressure. Okay. Now, from 3 you have another turbine bringing it to state 5. So, now notice that if this were not there the dryness fraction would have been as low as that for this state. Now, we have been improve, able to improve the dryness fraction 
increasing the efficiency of the second part of the turbine as well as the life. The liquid at P s has a low enthalpy and we are unable to make use of it. So, either it is put in a feed water heater, but in this exercise it is said that it is throttled to the condenser pressure and is mixed with the condensate, is completing the cycle. The other part of the cycle I have not shown. Twenty seven is steam regeneration with two feed heaters. Rank in two feed heaters. Coming to the last page. 28, we go back to refrigerator cycles here, refrigeration and air conditioning cycle. This is a joule cycle, there are some component efficiencies also involved. First an ideal cycle, then the component efficiencies. Then 29 is the same cycle with the modification that we have an ideal regenerator and then a real regenerator. So, at this stage we need to explain to the students how a regenerator works. This is the modification that we talk about. Then 30, 31, 32 and 33 are vapor compression refrigeration plant. One is with ammonia, another is with R134 A, third one is also with R134 A and the fourth one 33 is with R22. So, we do not have in our steam tables the data of this, but the textbook which you use will have the data at the end in an appendix or uh, you go to the net and you will find a reasonable uh, set of uh, T s diagrams, P h diagrams, H s diagrams as well as tabulated data. Select one and uh, solve these exercises. But again as I said my aim in any course on thermodynamics is not to worry about the final answer, but to really uh, emphasize that the process of obtaining a solution is perhaps more important than the actual numbers which form part of the solution. So, that brings us to the end of a discussion on cycles and essentially end of the presentation. So, we have something like 10 minutes to tea time. So, I will take a few questions and in the last session between 4 and 5 30, I will be here and uh, hopefully for most of the time professors Bandarkar and Puranik will also be here. So, we will take questions. Tomorrow uh, as I have announced earlier uh, 9 to 10 30 would be the general discussion session, uh, 10 30 to 1 will be test 2, 2 to 3 30 would be the final concluding discussion session essentially a feedback session and uh, 4 to 5 30 will be the valedictory function. A note to uh, the coordinators, I am told that uh, on Moodle a feedback form will be available sometime tomorrow. The participants are expected to fill the feedback form any time from the time it is made available 
to maybe uh, three or four days later. If they are not at your center after the course, they can go to their homes or their home institutions and fill up the questionnaire from there. The deadline will not be like a test 30 minutes or a few hours, it will be a few days, maybe a week at least. Okay, that is what I am going to tell them. And if uh, any uh, center wants to have a local valedictory function, uh, you may arrange it from 5.30 pm onwards tomorrow. So, that brings me to a few questions before I uh, start. 1128 VNIT Nagpur, over to you. Sir, uh, you said in the refrigeration cycle, the process, throttling process H1 is equal to H2, sir. So, how it is possible, sir? Because in case of that, the H2, the uh, temperature and pressure, it will drop you. Right. The temperature drops. The pre, uh, first thing, throttling process, I think we have done an exercise on this. The throttling process is a process in a open system. Let us say this is the throttling device, either a capillary or a open valve. If you set up a open system across it. It is a one inlet and one exit. Say this is inlet, this is exit. One inlet and one exit open system, steady state, some m dot flows and the requirement is that P i and P e should be such that there is a significant pressure drop. The areas etcetera are handled such that delta E k and delta E p are negligible. See, if you look at the enthalpy differences that we look at, this delta E p which would be uh, m which would be actually g into h, uh, where g is uh, of the order of 10 meters per second per second and h will be of the order of a few meters per second, a few meters. So, g h will be of the order of uh, say 40, 50 joules per kilogram, which is 0 0.05 kilojoules per kilogram. Our enthalpy differences are typically tens or hundreds, so sometimes even 1000 kilojoule per kilogram. So, delta E p is usually negligible. And also except in case of nozzles, delta E k is also pretty small compared to delta H. So, these are good assumptions. Now, with this and the fact that there is no work transfer, there is no heat transfer just not attempted to extract work and it is reasonably well insulated. So, q dot is 0 and so is w dot s. You will notice that the first law of thermodynamics in steady state when you apply to this, you will end up with H e equal to H i. Yes, sir. That is what happens in a typical throttling process. And throttling process are commonly applied in refrigeration, air conditioning plants of the vapor compression type and they are also used for uh, measuring wetness in steam or moisture of steam using uh, throttling calorimeter or their its modifications. Over to you. Next question, why we cannot calculate the efficiency in case of heat pumps, sir? Why? See, when it comes to refrigerators and heat pumps, we do not use anything called efficiency at all. We use a parameter known as coefficient of performance. And I have defined the coefficient of performance today morning. I think I have it somewhere here in the very beginning. Efficiency is defined only for engines. When you have a refrigerator, coefficient of performance is defined as refrigeration effect divided by power consumed. And if it is a heat pump, our interest is in the heat supply. 
So, we define the coefficient of uh, performance as the rate at which heat is supplied to the hot place divided by the power consumed for running the heat pump. Over to you. Hello, sir. Go ahead. Uh, why the uh, why the compression ratio in case of diesel cycle is more than that of the auto cycle? Okay. First thing is, in case of auto cycles, you have in actual practice you have a pre-mixed uh, air fuel mixture, okay. air petrol vapor. Now, if you compress it by a larger compression ratio, the temperature will rise and it will start the, the combustion process will start even before or may start even before the uh, piston reaches the top dead center. We do not want that to happen. Hence, the compression ratio is restricted to roughly 10 that is known as pre ignition and that is not a good thing to happen in an auto engine. Whereas, in case of diesel engines only air is being compressed and we want to reach a temperature high enough where the diesel will heat get heated, evaporate, mix and then start burning on its own because of the high temperature. Hence, we want a compression ratio which is larger and typical compression ratio is around 15, 16, 18, I think 14 to 22 is the range you will find in different diesel engines. Over to you. Thank you. I think I will take one more center. 1077 Federal Institute of Science and Technology, Ernakulam. Over to you. Good, good evening, sir. Am I, am I audible, sir? Yes, go ahead. Sir, my, my doubt is regarding the second law problem, SL5. SL5. Uh, sir, you have already solved that problem in the discussion session, but my uh, doubt is how to, how to calculate the entropy change in that problem. How to calculate the entropy change in SL5? Okay. Uh, remember, I will only show the process diagram. Initial uh, pressure is P naught, final pressure we have shown is P naught by 2. Initial volume is uh, initial specific volume is some 2 V naught, final specific volume will be half of that V naught. The initial state is P naught T naught. This is the initial state 1, the final state will be 2, right. Occupies a larger volume and uh, I am showing this just by means of a dotted line. What I have shown here, this dotted line is the isotherm, this is the process representation. The question is, how do you calculate S2 minus S1? Okay. I think that is the question, right? Okay. Now, remember that by definition this equals initial state to final state dq by t for any reversible process. What the actual process is, we just do not have to worry about. Now, set up a reversible process between state 1 and 2, analyze that in detail and integrate dq by t over it. 
Now, since it is an ideal gas with constant specific heats, actually constant specific heat does not come into picture, we can consider that because the initial state is at a temperature T naught, the final state is also at a temperature T naught. Let me take a thermal reservoir at temperature T naught. Let the system be brought into contact with it across a ideal diathermic wall and I will slowly allow the system to expand from P1 to P2, from state 1 to state 2. As I do that, I will execute a reversible isothermal process as shown by green on this. So, this is a reversible process used to evaluate dq by t reversible. This process has nothing to do with the process which has actually taken place. Sir, can we use the general expressions that we have already derived for the general? Yes, you can use those general expressions which is C V L n T 2 by T 1 plus R L n P 2 by P 1 and all those. Any one of those equations you can use. So, for, the, so for that derivation we have started from a simple compressible system and uh, D, D Q is equal to D E plus D W reversible. But yes. Here, it is not reverse, reversible then how we can use this equation for this particular? No, no, no. By definition, this is the definition of uh, delta S. So, you have to consider a reversible process for evaluation of delta S and using an appropriate reversible process, we have derived those general expressions for uh, S2 minus S1 in terms of either temperature ratio or pressure ratio or volume ratio. If you use that general expression, you will get here the entropy uh, change to be uh, R into T naught into, uh, into mass of the system into logarithm of 2, because the final volume and initial volume have a ratio of 2 to each other. Over to you. Sir, I have one more doubt, sir. Yes. I have, I have one more doubt, sir. D during the throttling expansion of the vapor compression system, uh -huh. the entropy is increasing. Yes. Could you please explain that, uh, in, in that reason for the increase of entropy during that process, if necessary in the molecular level? See, I am not looking at the molecular level, but even otherwise, uh, the it is an irreversible process, because fluid is flowing across a finite pressure difference without extracting any work from it. Okay. So, it is an irreversible process, even if I want to I cannot make it uh, go the other way through a throttle valve from a low pressure fluid flowing out as high pressure fluid. So, since it is an irreversible process, the basic principle of thermodynamics tells us that we have no choice but to have the entropy at the exit higher than the entropy at the inlet. You can go through the property relations and show that it will likely to or it will happen. But we do not really have to go into kinetic theory or molecular aspects for this. Over to you. Uh, viscosity of the flow, is it due to the viscosity of the fluid? What did you ask? Due to the viscosity of the fluid or the friction related with the flow? Is it due to the yes, in a way it is related to friction with the flow. This, this is a particular example of uh, fluid friction which is comparable to a solid friction between a brake and a brake liner. I think we will stop here now.